Okay, as promised, we're now going to have a look at the evidence that things are related. So this is the information that is used to build uh, these phylogenetic trees. <coughs> so, obviously, in the olden days, you were pretty much looking at uh, what we call morphology. So this is the... Uh, kind of what an organism looks like, what shape it is. Um, <clears throat> certainly when I was trying to sort out the phylogeny of fossil fish in Scotland, I was doing a lot of measurings of skull um, uh, lengths and widths and working out ratios and seeing whether the ratio was the same across all the specimens I've got. And so we've got morphological features and these were the ones where, you know, we were saying retractable claws and meat-eating teeth. And, you know, if they've got meat-eating teeth, then probably they're in the same uh, order. And if they, you know, compare, then they're probably in the same genus. So we've got morph morphology, and that's, you know, pretty good evidence. However, beware. Because there is something called convergent evolution. So this is the sort of health warning on this. So if you look at an echidna, spiny echidna, porcupine uh, and a hedgehog, they all pretty much, they, they look small and have spines and they've got fur and they're all mammals, but the spines are a protective thing. So They've kind of evolved, if you like, independently. So the same problem being solved uh, of having spines for protection. So that's called convergent evolution. And if you think about sort of sharks, dolphins, fish, all being very streamlined and, you know, all having a dorsal fin, that's an example of convergent evolution. So it's not, you know, so some, you know, if you were just looking at features, you would put dolphins and sharks into the same group. Why wouldn't you? They look pretty much the same. We've also got, um, that you need to know about, homologous features. So, our pentadactyl limb. Now, in evolutionary terms, oh, can't spell pentadactyl. I've missed a DA out of it. Um, can't talk and spell at the same time. Pentadactyl limb, but what does that mean? Five digits, and pretty much that's quite widespread. So, um, if you look at the groups that have got it in the chordates, we've got the amphibia, reptiles, and mammals, and within that, We've pretty much got the same pattern, so it's evolved once, but it's adapted to different functions. So even if you look at, uh, I've got birds. So <clears throat> pretty much between sort of you know fish and everything else. Somewhere the pentadactyl limb has evolved. So if you're doing a phylogenetic tree, you'd have, you know, fish there. And then you've got that pentadactyl limb evolving. And then you've got all your other branches off that. So same pattern adapted to different functions. They're called homologous structures, as opposed to analogous structures, where they've got the same function. but they've evolved from different structures. So I hate to go on a bit Game of Thrones on you, but the uh, wing of, say, uh, an insect, the Game of Thrones dragon, a bat, and a bird. In bats and birds, these are homologous structures. These are modifications of the pentadactyl limb. Game of Thrones dragon apparently has four 
limbs with pentadactyle limbs at the end, which is a bit weird. And um, but it's also got two wings. It's got two extra bits of bone sticking out of it, supporting a wing. Whereas an insect, completely different uh, origin of those structures coming out from the thorax. <coughs> so they're analogous, but they all do the same function. They allow the organism to fly. So we've got morphological evidence. We also have um, more up-to-date sciency type evidence and here you're looking at uh, polymers you're looking really at polymer sequencing so what polymers have we got available to do this with we've got uh, amino acid sequences in proteins we've got uh, RNA base sequences and if you think you know pretty much all organisms have ribosomes you know even bacteria we can base sequence the RNA that makes that and we've got DNA base sequences do you read the question they're asking about proteins, they're asking about amino acid sequences, they might tell you they've done RNA based sequences or DNA based sequences. No one of these, actually probably RNA and DNA probably are a bit more useful than amino acids given that amino acid sequences you're looking at inside that you've got a three base sequence and of course it's degenerate so uh, you might if you can't sort it out on amino acid sequence, you might then need to go to the DNA or the RNA based sequences. Um, but these two, you know, they're, they're pretty sort of equivalent. So what are we saying about those sequences? That the more similar they are, the closer the relationship. So we've got polymer sequencing. The other sort of um, bit of evidence that we've got is we can do uh, something that I find very entertaining, which is, uh, even though I don't know, I really like immunology on my thing, uh, we've got immunological evidence. So um, effectively how this works is you get a mouse or some other organism it's just I can only draw mice. It's my mouse. And you inject it. Let me do a little syringe there. You inject it. What do you inject it with? You inject it with, you know, serum or uh, some antigen. From a different organism so not another mouse and what the mouse does in response is it produces antibodies so antibodies are kind of y-shaped with a little sort of bind specific binding site at the end so what this mouse is doing is producing antibodies for those particular antigens and will clump together the cells that have those antigens on them. So, what you get is a little set of sort of clumps of cells. This process is called agglutination. And so it forms um, pretty much a sort of a, I wouldn't like to say it's a precipitate, but let's think of it like that. So say we're looking at humans. So we put in 
our antigen from our human and then you get a set of tubes and we want to know how closely related humans are to chimps and uh, say the gorillas. I was going to put orangutans, it's too long a word, too lazy. So you mix the antibodies and the, it's usually a serum, maybe blood, uh, something like that, into, the, into that. So obviously humans, it's produced antibodies, it clumps together all of the cells so you get 100% agglutination. The chimp doesn't have quite the same antigens, so not all of those will react and you get less. And if the gorilla is even less related, you know, you only get so much clumping. So, what does that tell us? It tells us that humans are closer to chimps and further away from gorillas. And then you can put it onto a phylogenetic tree so that you've got, you know, chimps and humans there, chimps there, gorillas there. Oh gosh, 11 minutes. Um, so we'll have a look at some data in a later video, I think.